All right, man, peace. You know, brothers, it's so interesting how life starts to reveal itself, how it unfolds. The scriptures tell us that a tree shall be known by its fruit. So now it's becoming more and more obvious to me why certain media pundits like Nick Wright and Shannon Sharp and Colin Cowherd, Max Kellerman, and so many of the other LeBron James apologists scattered throughout the liberal sports media are so comfortable making up excuses for LeBron's shortcomings because he himself is comfortable doing that. I've never ever, since I've been watching sports, and I've been watching sports since 1990, 89, 90, that area, I've never seen an athlete who has been held in such high esteem, who is so eager to make excuses for himself when he comes up small in the biggest moments, which he consistently does. This man, LeBron James, had the nerve to come to the post-game press conference podium with a damn woman's scarf wrapped around his right wrist talking about it's a cast. I said, is this nigga out of his damn mind? I said, what the hell is going on here? I get so many of LeBron James' stupid fans on my channel talking about why you make so many videos about LeBron, why you make... All I do is make videos about the topics that they're speaking about on many of these debate sports talk shows. That's all I do. And everyone knows that during the basketball season, LeBron James dominates the topics on those shows. Why is that? Because he is a theater diva. That's what he is. I've never seen a more theatrical sports superstar in all my time watching the three major sports and boxing than Mr. LeBron James. To be quite frank with you, I'm eager to see and hear what Nick Wright and Shannon Sharp are going to come up with on Monday for LeBron James' flame out in Game 4. So let's see what LeBron James himself has to say. Durant, Sam Amick, USA Today, tweets out LeBron's been playing with a serious bone contusion in his right hand since Game 2, I'm told. There was also a report from Brian Windhorst that he had punched a whiteboard after Game 1. Here he is at the podium. To like I've told you brothers already, LeBron James has a series of liberal sports media journalists scattered throughout the media world whose job it is to dispense his propaganda. People like Brian Windhorst and Rachel Nichols. He has plants at these various channels like Nick Wright and Shannon Sharp. Some of you brothers may remember a video that I did pertaining to a debate that Skip and Shannon were having in which Joy Taylor chimed in and stated that Shannon Sharp has been compromised by the LeBron James camp and that there's a reason why Shannon always takes LeBron's side in these debates. And Skip looked quizzically at Shannon and seemed as if he was interested in getting to the bottom of it. It was not surprising to me at all, as I've told you brothers already, Mr. LeBron James is a politician. He's the number one politician in the sports world, and he's the number one opportunist. He's like the basketball version of Jay-Z. He's talented, but he also believes in utilizing skullduggery when necessary if it means more fame for him. That's why I've told you that he plans on trying to usurp Colin Kaepernick as the number one woke athlete because it's good for his brand. But anyway, let's get back to this foolishness right here. Two MRIs and a soft wrap on his hand. Take a look. Yeah, soft wrap on his hand to match him. Take a look. Look at this nigga. This nigga got his wife's scarf wrapped around his right wrist. All of a sudden, his right hand is broken. Well, first question, Joe on the left side, second row. Joe Barton, Clean.com. LeBron, we're just learning about um, your hand injury, and we can obviously see the brace. Um, can you take us through what happened and if it caused you any problems over the final three games? I think that this so-called hand injury is meant to represent his spirit. Because it wasn't his hand that got broken after game one. It was his spirit that got broken. Uh, what happened? Uh, Self-inflicted. Post-game after game one. Uh, very emotional. No shit. Um, you know, for a lot of different reasons. Understanding how important a game one is on the road for our ball club. Um, what would that done for us? Um, you know, the way we played. The calls that was made throughout the course of that game. And I had emotions on, you know, the game was taken away from us. I had emotions of, um, you just
just don't get an opportunity like this on the road. Sure you do. It's called game two. You get plenty of opportunities on the road, Mr. LeBron James. If you were a real leader, you would have understood that. I've seen many games, and not to juxtapose this guy with Michael Jordan, but I've seen many games where the Bulls have lost tough games on the road, and you know what they did? They swallowed it, they took it like men, and they came back in the next game and got the job done. Of course, the 2018 Cleveland Cavaliers are not the Chicago Bulls. But one of the reasons why they're not the Chicago Bulls is because this man is nowhere near Michael Jordan mentally. We're not even talking about skill set. We're just talking about mentally. I brought up this game in the past, in the recent past. In 1998, the Bulls went into Utah game one. They were dominating the Jazz throughout the game. Jordan was making it look easy. And then he had a couple of mental faux pas. The game went into overtime and they lost. You know what they did game two in Utah? They won the game. That's what they did. Game five of that series, they were supposed to close it out. Carl Malone got hot. He scored something like 39 or 40 points. They had to go back to Utah. You know what the Bulls did? They won in Utah. For LeBron James to try to make this series about game one, nigga, you were going to have to win at least two games in Golden State to win the series. Because even if you would have won game one, there's no way that you would have won both games in Cleveland in games three and four. So this is just LeBron James trying to play the blame game as usual. It's always somebody else's fault. It's never his fault. Old first Golden State to be able to get a game one. Well, you didn't get the game one. Move forward. Life is about moving forward. You won't move forward past the fact that you no longer have hair on the top of your head. So now you want to wear hats low over your eyes like you're a damn stalker. Looking like a damn fool. And, um... You know, I let the emotions get the best of me and pretty much played the last three games with a broken hand, so. So in other words, you let your emotions get the best of you in the finals. So you're a bad leader. That's really what you're saying. Because you had a chance to regroup your team for game two and you failed to do so because you were so busy dwelling on game one. And this is why I told you, brothers, back in the preseason, the reason why they brought Dwayne Wade in was to act as psychological support for this man. Because he's very, very fragile mentally. If things don't go his way, he will implode. Yeah, so that's, that's what it is. And then um, I recognize the finals just ended, uh, but I, I know you're ready for these, these questions. Do you, do you feel like you've played your last game for the Cavs? It's not about feelings. It's a fact. He's done with Cleveland. Unless they do something amazing, they blow him away with some type of strange offer out of left field. He's out of there. Where he's going, who knows? But what he will enjoy, he'll enjoy all these teams all across the NBA thinking that they want him on their squad. Unless you have a front office on the level of a Pat Riley in Miami, I don't believe that you should want LeBron James. Because what really is he going to do for your locker room, for your franchise? Is he going to win a championship if he goes out west? There are only two franchises that he can join in the Western Conference where you could say, well, they have a viable opportunity to get to the finals. That's the Rockets and San Antonio. Is he willing to subjugate his ego to work under Greg Popovich? Is he willing to go to Houston and play a style of ball with two other players that are the same type of players as him, ball-centric players? Can he do that? I don't think so. I really don't. I think that if he found a way to subjugate his normal inclinations, he would have a great chance of winning a championship with the Rockets. But I just don't see him as an off-the-ball player. And he's also going to have to learn how to play off the ball with San Antonio. Unless Greg Popovich just sits back and says, you know what, LeBron is your team. Your wokeness is more woke than my wokeness. Who, Who the hell knows? A lot of these nut jobs in the NBA. If he were to go to another team in the Eastern Conference, where could he go? I myself believe that the best fit for him would be the Miami Heat. But could he go back to a franchise that basically told him, we're not going to let you tell us what to do? It would almost be like a rambunctious and rebellious teenager moving back in with his or her parents and once again having to follow their rules. Could he go to Philadelphia and somehow accept that he would not be the primary ball handler Ben Simmons would have to be? Could he play off the basketball there? Or... Might he have his team call up Danny Ainge and say, look, you have a great crop of young players. I'll come there on one condition. You trade Kyrie. 
Who knows? Um, I mean, I have no idea at this point. Um, you know, the one thing that I've always done um, is, is consider, you know, obviously my, my family, understanding, you know, especially where my boys are at this point in their age. Um, they were a, a lot younger. The last time I made a decision like this four years ago, you know, I got a teenage boy, a preteen, a little girl right now that wasn't around as well. Um, so, you know, sitting down and, and, and considering everything, you know, but, you know, my family is, is a huge part of whatever I've decided to do. I'm in my career and they will continue to be that. So I, I don't have an answer for you right now as far. Look at LeBron with that damn hat pulled down over his eyes, looking like the Unabomber. And now as far as that. Tim, all the way in the back. Look at this nigga here. <laughs> this fool look like he's about to sing. This is what it sounds like when doves cry. <laughs> LeBron, two questions. One, all the way in the back. Two questions. One, how do you want this season to be remembered given you know guys in their 15th year don't do this at all how do you want this year to be remembered for me personally yes well you personally i thought that you played for the cleveland cavaliers shouldn't you first want to reflect on what your team did why is your default response regarding you personally lebron james um i have no idea i mean um that's that's for you guys to kind of figure out bullshit you know that it's all up to you because you control the narrative. Most of those people out there in the audience are nothing but pawns. You know it and I know it. Uh, how you want to characterize my, my 15th season? Um, you know, it's definitely been a whirlwind. It's been, uh, it's been... You love whirlwinds, LeBron James. You love whirlwinds. Much like the liberal single black female that raised you, you love whirlwinds. You love drama. You don't know how to exist in placidity. You love the storm. You don't love the calm. It's been ups and downs, it's been good, it's been bad. Um, you know, for me, I just try to be, you know, be consistent throughout the course of the season, be the leader I know I can be for this ball club. For this. You have been consistent. That's one thing that I will say about you. You've been consistently full of chaos. Not just this season, but throughout your career. That's why they literally had to detonate an entire roster to serve you. Brought in a slew of new players that were willing to follow the LeBron James system. And all they got in return for their obeisance was you throwing them under the bus. You got in a press conference after game three and threw every last one of them under the bus. Because you failed to lead them LeBron James. And the problem is not them. The problem is not even what occurred this season. The problem is that there has been no coach since he's left Miami that has been able to coach him because he believes that he's smarter than everyone in basketball that's what he believes and he keeps running into the same problems he keeps running into team intelligence as opposed to individual intelligence individual basketball iq will always get trumped by team basketball iq but for this franchise every night no matter what was going on from the outside or the, in, or the inside and um, you know be reliable every single day showing up to work every single day putting in the work and um, you know grinding every single day so working hard is great working smart is better single day so um, you know I, don't, I have no idea how um, the story will be talked about in my season but um, oh you have a very good idea how your story is going to be talked about LeBron James you're going to make sure that all the plants scattered throughout the liberal sports media write very glowing reviews on your 2017-2018 season. They're all going to talk about how no player in his 15th year has ever done this, has ever done that, how you endured while the rest of your team languished, how you endured after the trade, how they brought in a lot of cast-offs from around the NBA, and you led them like the Pied Piper to the promised land. But you fell in the last battle. They're going to make you out to be basketball's William Wallace or some shit. Cleveland Cavalier Braveheart. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's not, I know I punch the clock in every single day. And uh, that's for me to, um, I understand that and I, I'm okay with that. And to kind of follow up on one of Joe's questions, you've gone through this dance that's coming this summer. You've gone through this a few times. Do you anticipate this just because of, like you said, the family and, you know, your kids going into high school and, your age and all those things do you anticipate this summer being the toughest as far as deciding what the right path for you is 
let me say this. I think that this will be the toughest summer for LeBron and his team to figure out exactly what they want to do and where they want to go. I really do. Because the landscape is kind of bleak for LeBron right now. He doesn't have buddies to team up with for the most part. Unless he plans on going to Houston. And how exactly is that going to work with Chris Paul wanting the max, James Harden already receiving the max, and LeBron James declaring that he will never again sign for anything less than the max? How is that going to reflect on their team? They're going to have to cut many of their more notable players. Are they going to be able to bring in enough shooters who are going to be dogs like most of the dogs that the Rockets had last season that had them within a game of going to the finals? Are they going to be able to replace that for the sake of LeBron James? Who we're not even sure is going to fit in to that system with Mike D'Antoni. Because he's never shown himself to be fully willing to play off the ball and to not be fully in control. Um, no, I feel like Tim was the toughest. Rachel up front. Rachel, that goes ESPN. LeBron, how would you characterize these playoffs for you? For me personally? Um, and the team. And the team? That's the second time that he was asked a question and his default response was for me personally. The reporter, Miss Rachel Nichols, had to specify and the team because she really meant for the team first. If he was as team oriented as he tries to act, he would ask for the team. Well, we'll start there. I think that we had an up and down season, so on and so forth, blah, blah, blah. And then he would start talking about himself. Team, um, you know, I, I wonder if we could, could hit a switch. Um, some way somehow just because of the course of the regular season it was just like why would you wonder if your team could hit a switch some way somehow when number one in all four of your seasons with Cleveland you never won more than I believe 53 games if I'm wrong about that one of you brothers can correct me you guys have never been juggernauts in a regular season because of you Kyrie Irving demanded a trade and on your behalf the Cleveland Cavaliers front office once again they decimated the Cleveland Cavalier roster and brought in a series of players who some may describe anywhere from cast off to unremarkable to being filled with potential but never truly fulfilling what many of the so-called NBA experts had prognosticated for them. So at best you had to consider the remainder of the season a crapshoot LeBron James but a very suitable crapshoot for you because it would exonerate you of being involved in any of the real issues as to why the team was not as, as successful as many thought it could have been. You escaped culpability, sir. I don't know. You guys asked me a lot. You know, our beat writers, you know, kind of asked us throughout the whole, you know, season. And, and then we made the trades. And right before the playoffs, a couple a couple weeks before the playoffs, do you feel like your team is ready for the postseason? I, I didn't know. You know, it was just the unknown. I mean, our season was kind of the unknown. And, um, you know, I wondered if, if we could hit a switch in the postseason. Um, I figured if I stayed laser sharp, if I came in with the right mentality, if I came in with the right mindset, that I could, you know, help fast track this, you know, throughout a lot of the games in the post. How could you think that you could fast track something that had no backbone, that had no foundation? Once again, you guys don't play a real system, neither offensively nor defensively. You do not play a real system. Isaiah Thomas already outed you guys. Your team doesn't even practice. So how could they get any better, LeBron James? It was in the postseason because my experience and because some of the other guys that experienced a lot of games and I was able to do that, we was able to do that. And um, uh, I mean, it's, um, it's somewhat, nigga. Come on, man. Get to the point. Here's the facts of the matter. LeBron James has to try to maintain this facade that he's this bionic person that never gets tired. But in the background, Ty Lu has to create all these loopholes in both the offense and the defense that will glorify LeBron on one end, the offense, and allow him to rest on the other end, the defense. On top of that, they're unable to build any cohesion with the team because LeBron James wants to save all his energy for the games so they don't practice. Well, here's the problem. Because LeBron James handles the ball as much as he does, it's not even like they can practice without him. So they need him, and at the same time, he's the reason why they can't come together. And yet he wants to sit in press conferences trying to act as if he has no idea why the team didn't grow. 
Look in the mirror. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, it's never a success. You know, it's never a success in the postseason when you lose. Not, not for me. Um, you know, I, I have no idea. But for me personally, um, you know, like I said, being reliable to my teammates, um, being able to, to play the game at a higher level with, um, with as many games, as many miles that I have on my body and, and um, you know, put together a run like I had in the postseason. Um, it's something that I can, you know, kind of kind of remember. Um, you, know, I, you know, the ending is, is um, obviously still fresh and, and still new and you never want. Bruh, there's no need for it to be that damn long-winded. You started off with a bang, you ended with a whimper. That's how your postseason went. Bottom line, you finished weak. You never wanted to lose, and, and, and especially in this fashion, being a competitor. Um, but a Competitor? Spell that. I'll spot you the C-O-M. Just hit me with the Pedator. I guarantee you couldn't spell that. <laughs> Dude, please. You went out like a straight sucker in game four, LeBron James. Once again, I want to see and hear what Mr. Shannon Sharp and Nick Wright have to say about this come Monday. Because they may try to hide it, but LeBron James can never be compared to Michael Jordan after this. This will certainly go on his ledger right there with his disappearance in the last couple of games of the 2010 playoffs against Boston and of course 2011 against the Dallas Mavericks. His performance in Game 4 of the 2018 NBA Finals, though not as bad as Kobe Bryant's Game 7 against the Phoenix Suns, it's up there because he was not bringing any willful action in the second half of that game. He gave up. LeBron James gave up. But it is what it is. You know, like I said, I punch my clock every day. I know you. Yeah, you punch your whiteboards too, allegedly. I know you have no way to know yet whether your time here is over or not. But I'm wondering what playing with the word Cleveland across your chest has meant to you for this second round. It's meant that he now has an opportunity down the line to own the franchise. That's truly what this all was about, brothers. He had to come back to the Cleveland Cavaliers so that he could re ingratiate himself with the Midwest market. Now, 20 years down the line, he can own the team if he wants to. Had he never come back from Miami, he could not do that. He would never have been welcomed with open arms. As a businessman, this was a brilliant decision. Even though I get on LeBron about his emotionality and many of his deficiencies in comparison to Michael Jordan, he is very Machiavellian when it comes to business, marketing, and politics. He understands those fields very well. And not only was he able to give Cleveland a championship in his return, but this will also set up many business ventures down the line. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I came back because I felt like I had some unfinished business. Uh, yeah, more ways than one. Um, you know, and you know, to be able to um, be a part of the championship team two years ago with the team that we had and, and, and in the fashion that we had is something I will always remember. Um, obviously, I think we all remember that. I mean, it ended the drought for Cleveland. It was 50 plus years. I think we will all remember that in sports history. So, you know, um, you know, when you have a goal, I think any individual, anybody, male, female, whoever the case may be, when you have a goal and you, you know, you like seek that goal out and you dream about that dream and you put everything and you can to uh, guys like this brace, huh? <laughs> guys like this, like this cast, huh? Um, you want me to sit right here for it? What great superstar athlete in sports history has ever willfully brought more attention to an alleged injury than this fool is doing right now? This is the person that supposedly is on Mount Rushmore of NBA players, allegedly. On the day is trying to show off his wife's scarf wrapped around his right wrist. Talking about he broke his hand when he punched the whiteboard after game one. Now, most real warriors, you never find out about this until five, ten years down the line. Like, how many people know that Gary Payton had a hairline fracture in one of his shins in the, in the series that the Seattle Supersonics played against the Chicago Bulls in 1996? Very few. Or that Michael Jordan had a broken bone in his index finger on his shooting hand in the 1998 season, his last season with the Bulls. Now, most of us know that Kobe Bryant had the same injury in 2010. But very rarely will great athletes allow you to know that they're hurt until years later. 
This fool is here waving around his prince glove on the dais, laughing and giggling. Uh, I don't even know where I was, Rach. Uh, I'm sorry. Next question. I'm sorry. He probably broke his hand carrying around his wife's purse like he'd been doing the last few games, trying to be a damn metrosexual, in addition to being a pansexual, allegedly. Dave standing on the left. Dave McGrenn of ESPN. LeBron, in 2010, you basically started, or part of a team starting from scratch in 2014, same process, and then four months ago, and we're able to, to get to the finals. If you had to do that again in your career, you know, basically start a, a team from scratch, what have you learned from, from this year um, that you know, you're a different team in February from what you're playing with in the finals? Well, it's, it's definitely not the most comfortable thing. Um, you know, to start a team from scratch because you, you, uh, the most important is health because you, you you need to, you know, build chemistry so fast. And, and, and No, actually, you don't need to build chemistry so fast because that's not going to work. When you look in the history of the NBA, when you're talking about championship-level teams, they build chemistry over the course of years. That's how you get to the championship level. He should know that for a fact because his first year in Miami, they couldn't win because they were building chemistry. So for him to honestly think that he was going to be able to build enough chemistry after the All-Star break with a group of players who at best were considered young players with potential shows you that he's not dealing with a full deck. He's not all there or he's being disingenuous because he understands that what acquiring those players really did was give him an out. It allows him to say, I had no help and camaraderie so fast on the floor and if you have multiple injuries or you have multiple bodies out you know when you're starting fresh it's, it's too hard you know and, and I think you know um, you know with this with this season that's that's what you kind of saw um, the difference between this season and the difference between my first year in Miami we didn't have many injuries um, at all we were, were definitely fresh together but myself and D Wade and Bosch um, you know, UD, you know, Mike Miller had a few injuries, but Chalmers was available. You know, and pretty much our team, we, we, we were pretty solid as far as being injury, not being injury prone. Right, but you still went to the finals and you choked in the finals. Your team had no chemistry for the entire season. The only reason why you guys played as well as you did is because you basically had the Eastern Conference All-Stars on your team. And you still came up short, LeBron James. So why would you think that you had a chance to do anything with this group of guys that you acquired at the all-star break, basically? Give me a break, man. Oh, um, obviously, my first year back here, we were headed in the right direction. And then we, we hit the postseason, and Kev has a separated shoulder with the tire with Ola Nick. And then Kyrie, you know, goes down in, in the, like the first or second possession in overtime of game one in the finals. Uh, you know, so, I mean, that's... That's just huge. And so, um, you know, being a part of the, the, you know, the start fresh mode is something that you definitely don't want to be a part of. It's, it's you know, has its, it has its uh, pros and, and it, definitely, it definitely has its cons. Jason up here. Athletic. When you tell Rachel you, had, you came back as an unfinished business, does one championship finish that business? I mean, it does for him. It does for him. What else is it going to do? He know damn well he's not going to win what with Cleveland next year, so he has to leave. He has to continue on his path to try to track down that quote-unquote ghost. <laughs> I mean, that's a trick question at the end of the day, and I'm not falling for that. It's not a trick. No, I'm guessing it is. Um, I mean, for me, I still have so much to give to the game. and um, I agree with that. You do have a lot left to give to the game of basketball. I agree with that, LeBron James. Just like Al Pacino is still in the acting world. He's not going to win any more Oscars, but he's still out there. You ain't going to win any more championships unless you humble yourself and go to the San Antonio Spurs. Or you find a way to be able to play off the ball with the Rockets, and they can still maintain their shooting. But other than that, you're not going to win any more championships, bro. You can forget about that. You know, like I said, when you have a goal um, and you're able to accomplish that goal, it actually... For me personally, it made me even more hungry to continue to try to win championships. And I, and I still want to be in championship mode. And I think I, I've showed this year why I will still continue to be in championship mode. And 
when you came back in 14 and we did the thing at Infocision, understanding things, things can change in four years, but you said you don't plan on going anywhere, you can't go through this again. What, what did you mean by that, and what's this process like, this free agency process of having to make a decision of where, what, can you just take us through, shed some light on what that process is like? Um, well, I mean, I'm not going to take you through all, throughout the whole process. That's not fun. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I said, you know, when I decide what I'm going to do with my future, uh, you know, my family and, and the folks that have been with me for the last, you know, 20 years pretty much, um, will have a say so. And then it ultimately will come down to me. So um, we'll see what happens. Howard standing on the left. Howard, back to Bleach Report. LeBron, when you made the move in 2010, obviously you had certain goals and, and, and things in mind that, that made you, uh, pushed you toward that decision. Similar 2014, are the decisions or the, the, the thought process priorities different at, at age 33, 15 years in than they would have been at those other junctures? No, I don't think so. These guys, they ask the most ridiculous questions. If you're going to ask him a question about free agency, why don't you mention specific teams? Because that's really the only way that you can get to a point. Of course, he's going to say, as of right now, I can't answer those type of questions. But at least those would be more cogent than the bullshit questions they're asking. LeBron, how do you think you will fit in with CP3 and James Harden in Houston? If you sign there, do you think that they will be able to retain enough ancillary talent for you guys to actually have a reasonable opportunity to win it all. If you were to sign with the San Antonio Spurs, do you believe that you would be able to play in the Greg Popovich Spurs system? How well do you believe that Kawhi Leonard will compliment you as a player? Those are real questions. All this bullshit about free agency options, he's not going to answer that shit. He's not going to answer the questions I asked either. The point being is that at least it would be something that would be more pressing, something more incisive. You know, to be able to, uh, you know, I made the move in 2010 to be able to, you know, play with talented uh, players, cerebral players, um, that you could see things that happen before they happen on the floor. And, and you t Yes, one of the main reasons why the players that you play with in Miami could see things happen before they happen on the floor was well, not only because they were gifted like Dwayne Wade was, but also because you ran an actual offense, LeBron James. Pat Riley and Eric Spolcher were not going to tolerate any of your bullshit. They made you go out there and run a real offense. And this is just another attempt to throw his current teammates under the bus. This is the guy who claimed that he would never go against his teammates. And your teammate can do the same, you know, throughout the course of a, uh, throughout the course of a season, throughout the course of a game, throughout the course of a playoffs, throughout the course of the finals. Um, so when you when you feel like you you um, when you feel like you're really good at your craft, I think um, it's always great to be able to be around um, you know other great minds as well. You know, and other great. So in other words, you're saying that your current team has a very low team basketball IQ. I wonder why that is. Maybe because it's very difficult to study for the LeBron James system in half a year. Especially if you guys can't practice because you have to conserve your old muscles so that you look good during the games, on offense at least. And other great ball players in my instance, and other great, uh, you know, just you know, I think studies of the game itself. So uh. now watch how much shit Tristan Thompson is going to talk about this guy after he leaves, because I guarantee you a lot of the Cleveland Cavaliers are tired of his bullshit. He has the nerve to sit up there on a dais with his wife's scarf wrapped around his right wrist, talking shit about his teammates' basketball IQ. But this guy barely would help any of his teammates on defense and refused to guard Kevin Durant one-on-one, -on -one, and he's supposed to be the greatest player of all time. The fuck out of here. And by the way, go back and watch that 1991 NBA Finals where everyone claims that Scottie Pippen guarded Magic Johnson for the whole series. Other than Game 2, when Pippen handled a lot of the defensive duties on Magic Johnson. The vast majority of the time throughout that series, Magic was guarded by Michael Jordan. Um, that's never changed. Uh, even when I came here, you know, at 14, I, I want to try to surround myself and, and, and surround this franchise with, you know, great minds and guys that actually think outside the box of the game and not just go out and play it. But anyway, that's it on LeBron excuse-making James. 
We'll see where his career takes him from here. But one thing that we do know is that the LeBron James greater than Michael Jordan conversation is done. It's over. Peace.